Welcome to Forever Unbreakable. I'm Will Koken. Uh, tonight I am joined by Charity. Uh, Charity is probably the most resilient person I've ever met. Uh, she probably won't admit to that because she's also the most humble person I've probably ever met. So Charity and I met at a at a football game um, where we actually got to meet Rob, the guy who killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, so that was uh, that was uh, an awesome game, but. Cooler than meeting him was honestly meeting Charity because that created for Fourth Hua, the event Freedom Freefall, where we've now, uh, after this year, we'll have taken over 100 veterans skydiving. So it's it's absolutely crazy. Um, and that v event came up because of the things that Charity went through in her life and how she got to a point where skydiving was what saved her life. And we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, but first, I want to kind of talk about uh, a bit about where Charity comes from uh, and who she is. So, Charity, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. So, welcome on to the podcast. It's super exciting to have you. Um, so, tell us a little bit about Charity, where Charity comes from. Um, where Charity comes from, geez. I was born in a small town in Minnesota lived in a small town in South Dakota, lived here in Green Bay, Wisconsin for a long time, and um, very average uh, upbringing, but big goals, always had big goals. So I um, was the type of person where when I was little, when I first went to swimming lessons, I was that annoying kid that was like, let's jump off the high dive, and they're like, you don't know how to doggy paddle, okay? <laughs> So I was like, oh, yeah, okay, well, let's do that, and then let's go off the high dive. So I was just rambunctious, always looking for adrenaline, didn't know it, didn't know that that wasn't, you know, everybody's thing. And um, that, somehow I learned how to harness that. So through high school, through college years, in my 20s, I used that energy that was a little bit bigger than the average energy and I created things. I created a business. I created another business. Um, I created plans for how to do things that I could only imagine, tried to invent things. So um, before I started my business, I was putting the plans together and I um, had a lot of friends in the military and I was thinking about joining and I met um, the person who I had a very long-term relationship with, uh, unfortunately, through bad circumstances, my friend Isaiah was killed in Iraq in 2004 in an accident. And um, his best friend was Brad. Brad was uh, somebody that I was friends with when, when he came back um, to kind of meet with the family and friends. Uh, we became friends. I was friends with him for a year or two. And um, then we started dating. And I thought, you know, gosh, he's getting deployed. He's taking all these risks. I already know the pain of losing my friends um, in yeah, Iraq. Yeah, lost one. Right, and Absolutely. and actually there were there were two before that. And um, I just thought, you know, there's nobody like this guy. This guy is one of a kind. Definitely, I'm I'm gonna take this risk. So we made it through some really long deployments, and uh, he came home, and we decided to start our life together. And he moved to Wisconsin. He's originally from Denver. How did he want to move to Wisconsin, or was that? He only visited in the summer. Oh, nice. So, so. <laughs> winter was a cruel reality for him. Yeah, well, I'm and sure. He couldn't take it. He's like, I can't drive my car here. It's too expensive to heat the garage to do what I want to do because he was a car guy. And he said, we have to go to Denver. And I was like, okay, no problem. <laughs> Mountains, that'll that'll be just fine. So we went to Denver, and uh, I started my business there. So instead of starting it here, which it worked out pretty well, um, started my business there, and uh, it was pretty successful. And through all that hard work, you know, he had adrenaline too. He was really getting a lot out of it, but it was kind of my dream, not really his dream. And um, after his last deployment, I noticed a big change in him. We lost a lot of friends and some of his closest friends. And he saw some of the scariest things on his last de deployment. And um, he did f like five deployments, didn't he? No, he, he only or did three. It? Okay, three. Still so, a lot of deployments. 
And they were long. I mean, back then, um, they were doing 18-month deployments. Yeah. They stopped doing that after a while. But uh, it, it was hard. It was really hard. And losing the guys, it was really hard. Going to so many funerals after a while um, just takes its toll. And so um, he started getting really depressed, and he was pushing people away. And I just thought, you know, he, he needs time for himself. He needs time to regroup, time to reintegrate. And uh, when he came home from his deployment, when before we moved to Denver, I went to Fort Bragg, and we went through all the classes where you have to figure out, you know, how do we make sure that nobody kills anybody while they're home and that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, we joke about it. We say it jokingly, but the awful reality is that you do have to reacclimate. Everybody has to reacclimate your friends, your family, everybody. So, um, I just thought, okay, well, he's got to kind of find his footing, but he didn't seem to find his footing and he kept getting worse and worse, started drinking more, started, um, driving crazy. I remember him coming home with the cops following him and going out into the driveway. And I was like, what are you doing? And the police officer said, you know, is, does he live here? Yes, he does. I'm sorry. You know, he's just enjoying his car. And they'd say, well, just, you know, tell him to maintain because he was taking risks. He was speeding a little bit, going fast down the street. Um, but obviously things that he wouldn't do had he not needed to get his, his adrenaline going. Yeah, and this is a man that you love, absolutely love. Absolutely, with all my heart. Like yeah. I care so how about did that, every cell in like, How body. did that make you feel at that time? Like knowing that, you know, he's not in a good spot because there, there's a lot of people that, that not just veterans, but people in general that are, are in bad places and, and going down that road and, and the impact, the one thing that I want to describe is like the impact it has on the person that is in love with you. you yeah. Know? I... I have, I think anybody that's been through this kind of always sees things in multiple perspectives. Okay. Because at the time, I saw it one way. Looking back, I realized how blind I was. But when I saw him going through that, I didn't know it was as serious as it was. I took it seriously. I told him, you know, I want to see you do better. I want to see you happy. I want... I don't want you to hurt. I don't want you to feel like you can't talk to me. And there were some things he couldn't talk to me about, but he would write in a journal. Okay. And he would call his buddy. His buddy would come over. They'd hang out in the garage. They would talk. And it did kind of put a rift between us that he couldn't open up to me about the things that were taking over his life. So I felt really closed off from him. Okay. And having made it through so many deployments and, and being successful in our relationship and having been so happy before, you know, we were the yeah. couple that never got sick of each other and people thought that was annoying, but yeah, we were friends. Yeah, and I can friends. see that the way that, the way that you describe Brad today to me when we have conversations, like I can, I can see that he is still your best friend. Absolutely. Like, you know. I mean, we know, we knew everything about each other. Yeah. We had the funny jokes and the gross jokes. He basically took every insecurity I had and just broke it, you know, got rid of it. And when we met, I was like 24 probably. Okay. So yeah. 23. And um, that was a little while ago. And uh, <laughs> We won't say how old you are. <laughs> right. But anybody at that age is going to be insecure about certain things. And when you really, really care about somebody, you, you want to be your best. Now, when you yeah. fall in love, you live with somebody, you get to know them, you get to know everything about them. If you're friends and that's what any good relationship is made out of you should be friends so getting back to the original question when you said you know how did it feel being that close person the best friend the you know yeah. the basically I don't want to say lovers and friends but I mean that's what we were no and that's what you should be like your best friend should be your your lover it should be the person that you're in love with yeah it has to be it that kind of Devotion, that kind of connection is a rare thing, and it's awesome. And I knew that back then. I didn't take it for granted. And um, watching him push me away was hard. Watching him push his family away was really hard. But watching him push his best friend away was, that's what really scared me. And I didn't realize that he was as low as he was. I thought, you know, he had just started counseling it, this is dredging up all of that old stuff. Yeah. 
And so that, along with his back pain and these injuries that he got while he was deployed, um, I just thought, you know, we're going to get through this. I never had a doubt in my mind that we were. I didn't think that we couldn't make it through because we made it through so much. When you go through your friends, your family dying and you make it, you kind of feel like you're going to make it through anything. And I believed that we could. Um, <clears throat> I have so many regrets about not seeing things clearly. And, um, which is hard. You're, you're living in the moment and you're, you're living in love and in love. I think a lot of times we don't, we don't necessarily see um, different things in, in another person or, or in ourselves. A lot of times you don't do a self-reflection. Yeah. Um, and I think that that, you know, plays into a lot of things because you're living in this moment where you think that either everything is perfect or it's going to get better, you know, and we're, we're on the right path. Like yeah, nothing can break us. And that's, you know, as we talk about unbreakable as a, as a brand or, or as a, as a model, like, there are things in life that break you, and it's as we were talking about before we started this. It's that that roller coaster of all those dips. Because in life, there's going to be dips. There's no way to avoid dips in life. Right. And you know, it's it's all about can you keep rising um, and gradually making those dips rise back up to a higher point in life. You know, and that's a, a lot of times when we're when we're living in in those dips and we think that we're seeing something. It's a lot of times it's not. It's not there, but we think it's there. We have so much hope that based on some of my past experiences, I've had a lot of hope that it was just going to fix itself. You know, when I went through the things after my deployment, I had a lot of hope that things were going to fix themselves. You know, when I went to counselors and got medicated and many of the same things that I'm sure Brad did, mm -hmm. um, that didn't work. Right. You know, and I, and I know that, um, having talked to you, you were at that point at one point and you went out and, and you took a chance on, yeah. on a, getting in an airplane yeah. that you weren't going to land in. Um, and it helped you, but, but can continue on. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, when I was saying, uh, you see things in, from a couple of different perspectives when you, you go through that, you know, what you thought at the moment and then looking back, what you think of it. Um, you know, you, you do see with rose colored glasses with the person that you love and, and it's hard because, you know the best of them. And when you see the worst of them, you know why, or at least you think you do. But he, I mean, the guy never got a cold. He was unbreakable. I thought he was unbreakable. Yeah. And looking back, that other perspective shows me that very shortly after he got home from his last deployment, he used to have really healthy adrenaline kind of outlets. Okay. Working out, you know, that kind of thing. Challenges with running and, you know, driving but at the track. Yeah. Um, so things like that. But very shortly after he got back from the, his last deployment, he had a lot of bad habits. You know, drinking too much, um, not being healthy, not eating right. He stopped exercising. Um, and that's the thing that I think broke him ultimately he stopped taking care of himself he stopped uh using his coping skills he didn't have some coping skills and that's something that he wrote about um in his journal and and, and unfortunately in in his uh last letter um so looking back at that other perspective now having uh not being able to look through rose colored glasses because it's all too real. Um, being unbreakable means that you push yourself through hard things with positivity. You have to push yourself with a good intention, something that is good for you. If you push yourself through something bad, through negativity, it will break you. You can't be unbreakable and completely negative it just doesn't work it doesn't go hand in hand yeah. you can get angry and actually if you get angry get your feelings out but don't hurt yourself don't do things that are unhealthy because a bad habit here a bad habit there they all add up you know yeah. if you have one bad habit 
if you are real with yourself, you keep it in check and you want to reverse that, it's never too late. Go ahead, make a goal, reverse that bad habit. For me, you know, looking at what happened, um, you know, I thought that he was going to make it through. I didn't know the severity of the situation and I wouldn't have, if anybody would have told me that it was even a possibility, I would have doubted it because he had never talked like that, never yeah. ever expressed um, having the ability to be so depressed, not that depressed. Um, so I guess I would have changed a lot of things if I had the chance, but in real life, when somebody's gone, they're gone. You can't go back in time. You yeah. want to. And and that's the hardest thing is that what happened um, that day, I guess, that he finally lost his battle with PTSD and depression. Um, he wrote a long letter basically saying that he was tired of hurting and he was tired of hurting other people. He was lashing out. He gave into his bad habits. And for some reason, he thought that he couldn't make up for what he did because it did hurt our relationship. He hurt his friendships. He lashed out at not just me, but really everybody. Yeah. And for some reason, he thought that he couldn't repair that. But I know myself, his friends, family, anybody, if he would have said, hey, you know what? I'm hurting. That's why I did this, and I'm sorry. If, it, if he would have just said that, people would have been like, hey, you know what? It's okay. What can I do? What should we do to make you feel better? So I guess uh, I'm getting a little <laughs> bit lost in, in, in the memory. And that's, that's another thing about um, going through something really tragic is that you do tend to get kind of lost in the fog when it comes to looking back on it. So you'll have to remind me now and then where yeah, we're at no, in, in I, the story. I, I like it, but I mean, yeah. it's like your story is it's so powerful. Uh, because of, you know, what you went through, um, with him at that time. And then, uh, what you went through after yourself, um, after the day that he, um, chose that he was at his bottom and chose to take his life that put you in, in a place emotionally, it put the family, his, you know, his good and best friends, like his unit members, mm -hmm. um, guys that had been to combat with him and, and he was watching their six and they were watching his six. And at that point, you know, I know the, the guys that I've lost to suicide. Um, at first it feels like you weren't watching their six and that sends you down an emotional, an emotional negative. Mm -hmm. And it, it does that for everybody. So talk about, um, kind of like what, what it was like the first couple of days, couple of months, uh, after, an, an, after, until you went, until you went out and jumped. Uh, I know for a fact, if, if he would have known what it's really like to be, to lose someone that way, he wouldn't have done it. He would never yeah. have inflicted that kind of pain on people because, um, it's so much worse than anybody can imagine. It's, it's the worst pain I can imagine. Um, having somebody die is tragic. Absolutely. Having somebody make the choice to do that is devastating. And, and in a way that it's not just losing that person, it's feeling so much guilt, so much weight of it. So when I, um, the day that it happened, I had gone to work and I didn't, you know, we, we had been arguing, which is another thing that I have so much guilt about. So I went to work. I didn't realize he was planning this and he, he, he built his own device for it. And, um, I didn't know what he was doing. And, um, his, uh, his job called me and they said that he wasn't there. And that was really weird, really not like him to not show up for work um, because he loved his job. You know, he got to drive a car on a dolly and, and test things. So that was his 
one of his dream jobs. Anyway, so that was really strange, and I knew he was up for a promotion, so I, I knew something was different, and I thought, okay, he's been really depressed, so maybe he's actually acting out, and that was a big deal for him to, like, skip work, not call. Yeah. Um, so I called his best friend, and I, it, who lived really close to our house, and I said, can you go over and check on Brad? And this is, you know, our, our guy, P-Roy. He has the key to the house. Um, we'd trust him with anything. And, um, and you still do. You still yeah. trust him with anything. Yeah, you know? I'm going to see him in just a couple of weeks. Which is awesome. Yeah, and uh, so I, I called him and he said, yeah, I'm sure everything's fine. You know, he's just going through some stuff right now, and um, don't worry. And I, I just said, I feel worried. I feel really worried. So just talk to him and just tell him, you know, I'm sorry, and we'll talk when I get home tonight. And I had a full schedule that day. I had multiple clients that I had to see the clients. I literally saw them walking through the parking lot. And um, when I when I realized I had to leave, I had to go home because p -Roy was not calling me back. And he, for him to not call me back knowing how worried I was, Brad wasn't answering the phone, something was wrong and I wasn't okay. And I just said, I'm really sorry, guys. I have to cancel today. I'll comp your appointment. I'll comp all and you're these the, And you things. own this business. So. Yeah, this was the business that I started. and um, So that makes it even harder because this puts bread on your table. It's not like, Right. These are know. big contracts. I had staff. Like yeah. My job had to make a certain level of income to where I could pay to run the business, pay for advertising, pay other people's payroll. So for me to cancel a day, like... It yeah, had to be a really big deal. You have employees that need you to absolutely to ensure that they make that they get paid. Right. So right. The, and, and it's that's a, why I want to explain that the significance of of at this point, like knowing that you are you you don't have a choice but to push this off to the side because you know, like, and that's and that's a big thing. It's a lot bigger than you know working like like how I work at the army. Like, if I got to leave, I just call my boss. And I'm like, I got to leave. And it's not going to have a huge impact. Whereas when you own a business and you just have to up and leave for the day, it's got a huge impact. So uh, yeah, that, and I think and that's important to know is like that that level of emotion is going on, that you know that you need to leave work. Right. You know? And I, I that's not the kind of thing I did. I mean, I remember one time I had surgery and I was back in two days. I broke my leg. Yeah. I was back in a day. I was mad that I couldn't go back to work the day that I broke my leg. Not that it didn't hurt. I'm not like, I'm not that cool, but I had to make it work because it was something that there was no one to call to go in and take my place. Yeah. So, um, and it's, it's I was super important that, that people day. know that, you know? Yeah. I, I just, I had this feeling that something wasn't good. And to me, you know, all right, I'm going to have to work that much harder later when I come back. And yeah, it's a big deal if I have to cancel my day. But for him to be so not okay that he didn't go to work, just skipping work, the idea of that scared yeah. me because that let me know he wasn't in a good place to that level. And um, because we're, we were both very committed people, very driven, you know, push through it. You can make it. You can do this. You got this. That's how we talk to each other. And... Um, <clears throat> I don't remember the majority of the drive, but I, I do remember part of it. And um, my sister called, or I called her. Either way, I was on my phone, and I just said, you know, um, something's wrong. Brad's not answering his phone. Peoria's not answering his phone. I just had this really creepy feeling. And I stopped at a stoplight, and I said, Sonia, I feel... I feel like something's really wrong. And she said, don't talk like that. And I said, okay. And I took a left onto our street. And that's where, in my mind, I just hear this loud, high pitch. And um, <clears throat> I remember the, the police lights and the street. Uh, the the officers motioned for me to pull over and I pulled over and um P Roy was there and he walked up to the car and he said, Charity, Brad's dead. And I 
screamed at him because in my mind, I was like, how dare you say something like that? How dare you? Like the logic was gone. There was no logic because in my mind, looking back, like that was an unacceptable reality. Yeah. And it was there in front of me and I couldn't make it go away. And I remember officers holding my wrists and I think I was like, <clears throat> trying to push them away or something. I don't quite remember exactly, but um, in the house, there's no way to describe the feeling other than just wrong. Everything was wrong. Everything was so wrong. And there were detectives, um, one main detective that had to walk me through the house, every single thing, every computer, phones, um, because wow. it's, it's a crime scene. When somebody commits suicide, it is a murder scene. And so everything has to be investigated, documented. It's not an open and shut thing. Um, I had to answer questions and they said, you know, how was he acting and, and what had happened between the two of you and all of these different things. And I just said, yeah, we had a fight. He's, but not a fight that should be like this, this way. Yeah. And, um, his friend explained that he'd been depressed for basically two years. I mean, it had gotten worse and worse and worse. And we just answered so many questions about, you know, um, they asked what these tanks were for and wires and all these things that, that he was using to uh, ultimately create uh, what took his life. And um, every single thing was so hard because he had gotten dressed up. He was clean shaved. He had a beard before that. Okay. And... Um, he took out his cello because he played the cello and he would never um, admit it to anybody, but I love the cello. And he got sheet music to our song and he had that all set up. Um, and he had his letters and they were really hard to read um, because I, I don't, I'm sure he was trembling when he, he wrote them. Absolutely. And uh, the, det the detectives had to take those because they're evidence. So, you know, as much as you can't retain something when, when that happens, um, they had to take it. And it was like they were taking parts of him. I felt like they were taking him. And I just remember being so frustrated and just telling them, I just want him back. I don't care what you take. I don't care what you do. I just want him back. Let me see him because I can wake him up. And at the time, I really thought I could. I thought, if I see him, if I touch him, if I hold him, I can wake him up. And um, I was not, uh, I, I couldn't accept that. And I felt like if they didn't let me see him in time, you know, they were going to make me unable to wake him up. I just couldn't believe he was gone uh the officers had me call his sisters and his mom and um his mom was out of the state and his sisters came over and they said you can't tell them what happened um until they get here because you can't they didn't want them driving erratically or, or getting in an accident or yeah. something and that's why Puroi didn't call me back because they said um that they didn't want me getting in an accident. And then it's safer that way. Right. And at the time, it's like, fuck safety. Right. I, I probably would have, you know, flown, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just get a cape and just, you know. But I, I just, even the drive there, just being worried. I don't remember the drive. So I understand why people say, you know, you, you need to handle this a certain way. Anyway, um, so... I know I'm leaving out a lot of details, but um, basically the emotion that I was feeling through this is when it plays back in my head, everything is heavy and it's in slow motion and it's thick. It's like hard to move, but yet everything is so real, even in my memory. And, and this happens every day. I 
think about bits and pieces of this every day, not intentionally, but it comes back. And I remember different things. Unfortunately, you know, I couldn't remember things for a long time. And when you do start to remember what happened, it doesn't always happen in order. So it gets really confusing. Um, the feeling that I had that day was that I was overwhelmed with sadness and anger and a sense of urgency. Like, I have to find him. I have to fix him. I have to yeah. do anything, anything to get him home. And a lot of those feelings were kind of like um, bits and pieces from when he was deployed and I was worried about him. You know, when we had to go for a certain period of time without contact, any words and, you know, the news comes on, something happens and it's near where you know your person is. And um, just thinking, like, you can't do anything. You feel helpless. Yeah. So I remember having a dream one night when he was deployed. And in my dream, everything was in photo negative. And for those of you that don't know what photo negative is, back when photos were with film, <laughs> you would get this thing of negatives in your envelope which was basically the key to make copies of your, your pictures. So photo negative, you know, Google it. Um, so everything was in photo negative and he couldn't see me, but I could see him. I was in uh, Iraq in, in my dream and uh, I was moving through the bear, or through their... Like housing quarters, yes. the tents or whatever he lived in at the time, pods. Yeah, it was basically through the pods and I was only able to move by putting my fingers on railing and then going over to him and he was sitting at his uh, chair and then I put my hands on his shoulders and when I put my hands on his shoulders he knew it was me and I could um, he smiled and I said I'm bringing you home and I sat on his lap and hugged him and just squeezed him and I said I love you and he said I love you too babe and I opened my eyes and it was no longer photo negative. It was real. And it, it yeah. felt real. I could smell in this dream. And I looked over and he was laying in bed with me. And I said, I knew I knew you'd be home. I, it worked. I brought you home. And he said, you did. I love you. It's finally over, meaning the deployment. And um, I blinked and he was gone. And it was a lucid dream. So it, it feels real. It feels like real yeah. life. And when I blinked, it was actually me waking up and realizing that he wasn't there. Like I felt the bed. I, I was like, Brad, and I looked and I walked through my apartment and, and I was like, that was a dream. That Okay, obviously that was a dream. So um, that sense of urgency that leads to those kinds of dreams and all of that, when, when your person's deployed, um, you just want them to come home. You know, you want them to do well. You want them to... Yeah. accomplish their goals when they're there, it, you know, carry out the mission. Exactly. But you want to have them come home because everybody's a little bit selfish. You want your person, right? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Um, when, when, when he was gone and this affects people that lose someone to suicide, even if they're not in the military, it's, it affects everybody in a way where you just want them back. You want that chance to say, I'm sorry. You want that chance to say the right thing to make them feel better, whatever it is, no matter what they're feeling. You just always feel like, I could have done something. I could have said something. And it is unique to each individual person, and it is unfortunately all too common and too similar at the same time. So... Leading up to the days um, before this happened, he was extremely happy and then extremely negative. And this is what we had an argument about because he was really acting manic and it wasn't like him. And I was getting upset. And I said, you know, you're, you push everybody away. You push me away. You, you know, tore apart everything that I'm doing and and you know he got really nasty for a while and all of a sudden he takes it all back and like everything's going to be like it used to be and I said how do you expect me to trust you 
that everything is going to be the same. The things you said and did were really difficult. It's going to take me time. We have to get back to being the way we used to be in terms of being friends and lovers, yeah. not just lovers. Absolutely. And not enemies. <laughs> so he, um, he wrote in his letter, I couldn't just be your friend and I didn't know how to be. I don't know. I don't remember the right words, but I didn't know how to be there for you is what he said. And he said, don't be like me. Don't blame other people. Because he did. He, he blamed a lot of people the last two years. He was full of blame. He had blame to go around. But um, I didn't know even the day that he died that, that this was all PTSD. I didn't understand post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. I had heard of it, but I didn't really know the depths of it. And um, and a lot of people don't. I don't think, even with all the science and, and everything that's that surrounds PTSD, I still don't think we know fully what it is. And a lot of things that people thought was PTSD is actually TBI. Yeah. And not PTSD, which leads to the leads to the same same place for the, a lot of people. The crazy thing yeah. about that is that because I work in, in a health related yeah. field, I um, <laughs> studied everything I could possibly study about PTSD, neurochemistry, I different it. parts of the brain. You know, I, I wanted to find answers and um, it took me a long time to get to the point where I was even learning more about it because initially when it happened, you know, the the day that it happened and then the next day, you know, you finally, I went to sleep where he died. I laid down on our bed and um, I, um, I laid down face down and, and my phone was ringing like crazy. <clears throat> my parents were calling. And, oh, I'm sure everybody's calling or yeah, texting or whatever. You know? Yeah, our nieces and nephews, his family, my family, and... Um, it's crazy because people call and they just kind of say your name and then they say like, are you okay? No, no, I'm not okay. Yeah. I'm never going to be okay. This is the worst thing that, no. Yeah, this is the man that I loved with all of my heart and soul. With everything that you are. You love yeah. that. When you're really in love, you love that person with everything yeah, that you even are. even when this was going on and he wasn't, you know, giving you the attention that you deserve and... and because he couldn't because of what was going on with him and you know you still loved him through that process and even in his deepest depression he still loved you through the process and that you know that is that's what love is when it's, you when you fall in love with somebody and you love them with everything that you are you love them for the sake that they're okay when we yeah. were fighting and I didn't think we were going to make it, I loved him and I wanted him to be okay. I said, you know, if it's me, if I'm holding you back, if I'm getting in your way, then you be with you. Yeah. I mean, we, we had every conversation you could possibly have because we were, I couldn't stop trying to find out how to make him better. And then when I finally... And this is my worst regret. When I finally had enough of a grudge to say, <clears throat> you know, I can't trust you. I can't trust that you're going to be the way you were before, that we're going to be the way we were before yeah. because the things you said and did are things that I can't just be okay with now. <clears throat> and I cried. And he said, I hate that I hurt you like that. And I said, I don't know that I can trust you to not do it or keep doing it again, because this was a two-year process. Yeah. So we went from having an amazing relationship for you know the first six years to two years of having a really not a good relationship, not a healthy relationship, but I still loved him. He still loved me. And he stayed by his side the I, whole time. I'm you, still by his side now. Absolutely. I mean, he's. it's crazy to say that, but I still have his clothes. I, I'm this week. And you're week, going to visit him in three weeks? Right, right. You know, like. It, that's not healthy either. <laughs> no, but it's, to, but it's important. I think that like, A, he's never forgotten. Right. Right. And that's the. That's like, healthy. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Like never forget. And B, like, 
he was and still is the man that you loved more than anybody else on the planet. So, like, to me, that's healthy. Like, go have a conversation. Get all of the stuff that you would have wanted to tell him over the last 12 months off of your chest. Like, he's there to accept that. Yeah. You know, and he and he wants that, I'm sure. I'm sure he can't wait to see you come back, you know, and see that that you are the person you are today and that you've gone from a point where you went through severe depression because of it and you've come out the other side now, you know, or continuing to come out the other side to being a stronger individual and being more unbreakable every day. And it's, that's why I say you're one of the most resilient people that I've ever met because if I lost the love of my life upstairs uh, to suicide or, or to anything, I don't, I don't know how strong I'd be, you know, you, it's, you don't until you're in there. It, you feel guilty for being strong. You feel guilty for surviving. You feel guilty for being living life in a different direction where that person's not there. Yeah. That that's something that's extremely difficult to overcome. And um, you know, looking back at you know when you say you're by his side, um, I felt like I wasn't. I felt like I. I felt like he died because I emotionally left him. I. I don't feel like I was there for him. And it, even though that in my core, that's how I feel, I know that he didn't take his life because we were arguing. I know that. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I have to say, you know, if he can hear me and, and see me now, um, I know he would say that. I mean, he wrote that in his letter. Yeah. And... Um, it's something that, you know, you always have regret. That's the, the kind of thing that is really, really hard. So uh, basically what happened after he died, I, I remember telling P. Roy, I will take back everything I ever said. And he was like, Charity, he was not being good to you at the end. He was saying and doing things that he shouldn't have done. And this is his best friend who loves him just as much as I do. Yeah, no, Different absolutely. way, but... You know, yeah. that's his, his brother, basically. So um, he reminded me that um, I couldn't just make everything in my mind seem like it was perfect. You know, it, it, you have to still remember everybody for who they are, including their flaws. Yeah. And be real with what, with what you're going through, with what they're going through, and learn as much as you can about how to handle things better. And that's, that's, you know, you could develop your coping skills. So the day after, um, he passed away, um, I remember waking up to P. Roy saying charity. He just, it's like somebody waking up, like yeah. screaming almost. And I went running downstairs and he said, it's, it's still real. This is a nightmare. And I said, I know, but it's a nightmare. And it was terrible. And my sister flew in. Um, his family came over. And uh, people were taking things because they wanted to have him, basically. Yeah. No, absolutely. It makes sense. And uh, I started getting really upset because they were, they were taking things. Like, this is his family, but yet, you know, I wasn't ready to let go of anything. Yeah. And... I also didn't want to stop them from taking anything, but I just felt like people were going through everything and I just freaked out and I was screaming and I was like, everybody just leave, just leave me alone. Just put everything down. I don't want to put things in boxes. I don't want to throw anything away. I don't want to get rid of this. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. And P. Roy kept me sane. I mean, not really sane, but... As close as, as you as can be. As, one, as sane as one can be in that scenario. Like, I can't picture anybody anybody being sane. So, no. you know, kudos to, to him for being able to, to do that. Because at the same time, with their friendship, you know, he is in a similar spot as you, I would assume. He was, and he was maintaining because he, you know, the kind of person he is, he put himself in a position where he had to take care of everybody else. 
P. Roy, me, Brad, we're, and Isaiah, actually, we're all kind of the same personality type where okay. we, we take care of other people. Yeah, And that's absolutely. what we do. And that's what you've done since the day I've met you. Well, you know, it, it's, a doubt, so. it's kind of the nature of, of how a person is. And, and when you, you go into somebody's life and you take care of them, sometimes you do forget to take care of yourself. They say that in healthcare too. You know, you take yeah. care of other, everybody else but yourself. <laughs> and um, so, you know, the months after that, I, uh, I I tried going back to work and I would open up a case file and I would be looking it over and I wouldn't be able to retain anything. I I flopped every interview, every consult, everything. I couldn't yeah. keep my head on straight and I was just a basket case and I was jumpy and I was crying and you know I just was not at all myself and um, I realized I had to close the business and just move home to be by my mom and just be with my family. And uh, it was really hard. I, I had, it was terrible. I mean, that was a really, I had to let go of everything. I had to admit to myself that he wasn't coming back because I thought if I moved, he wouldn't be able to find me like in some yeah. weird way. So when I moved, um, I moved his stuff with me, the stuff that I had left, his yeah. clothes. And uh, just a couple years ago, I did um, get rid of a lot of the clothes, donated them. And I still have some. And I need to now, this week, get rid of more. Um, it sounds like I'm like hoarding all of his stuff. <laughs> but it's really, it's like t-shirts and jeans. And I, you think, know? It's, I think it's normal. I don't think that there's anything out of the norm there. Um, I know that there are certain things that I would 100% keep of Chelsea's, like without a doubt. You know, and it, and it goes for the same thing with like my best friend Sodi. There are certain things that if something happened to him, I would, you know, his wife would obviously get first dibs, but then I'd be like, hey, can I have this? Like, I want a keepsake of him. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's absolutely normal. Um, and the memories. And it should be, you know. Yeah, the memories that those things make you think of are are why. It's like it's really not the t-shirt, it's not the jeans, it's the memories. Yeah. You know, he had this orange crush t-shirt that he wore every day. I mean, the thing <laughs> stunk. And I didn't wash it because it smelled like him. Yeah. It smelled like him for a really long time and then I put it in a box cuz it started not smelling like him. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, maybe there are some things I should get rid of. So, yeah. um, you know, the t-shirt is one thing that I'm, I'm going to hold on to, but you know, the rest of it, it's kind of like when you hold on to every single picture, every single thing, it's really what you're doing. And I didn't know this until I consciously had to admit that like, I'm moving his stuff with me when I move. Yeah. It started getting weird. Um, really what you're doing is you're trying to hold on to them. It's what you have left. It's all you have left because yeah. you don't have them. And they say you have the memories, but PTSD turns your brain kind of into Swiss cheese. Sometimes you don't have the memories, and the ones you do have are not the good ones. They're yeah. the worst ones. Um, I I had some really good memories, but clouded they're still by the bad ones. Yeah, it's yeah. clouded by the nightmare of the loss. So obviously there are stages of grief, and that is true of everybody when they lose somebody. I didn't want to admit it because, you know, you always have to say, this isn't going to, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to push through this or nobody else understands. They don't understand my situation. Yeah. Anyway, I, I obviously went through the stages of grief and um, one thing that helped push me through finally getting to the point, the story yeah. of how this all happened. So, uh, so let's talk about getting to Unbreakable. Like what, yeah, what, what did it for you? It basically was because Brad was an 82nd uh, airborne paratrooper, so he he jumped out of planes. Yeah. And I wanted to understand him better. I wanted to honor his memory. And uh, before I moved back to Wisconsin, um, I went skydiving for the first time in his memory and uh, d to honor him. And I invited some of his friends, and uh, I did that. And... Um, when I did that, the first time I did, it was just, I just wanted to for him. Um, and before the very first time 
when I got up to the, the edge and I was going to go out of the plane, I could almost hear him because he was the joker. I mean, he would yeah. joke about everything. And I could almost hear him say, see you soon. <laughs> like, okay, this shoot better open. Yeah. Right? So uh, it, it was incredible. I I got a rush and it was really, really amazing. And it was great for like a day. And then it I wasn't doing good anymore. And so, you know, this whole span of, you know, a year of depression and then skydiving, I decided to go more. And I started jumping in Colorado. Then I started jumping in uh, Pulaski when they had an airport. Yeah. And um, then I started going every single week, multiple times, Saturday, Sunday. And no matter where I was, if I was traveling, I would go skydiving. But it was starting to give you life back. It was... It was helping me feel. It was the only yeah. way I could feel anything because I had gotten so numb and so um, detached from everybody that I was scared. My family said, we're afraid for you because you are sad all the time. You don't care about anything anymore. You're not driven anymore. Um, and I kept thinking about you know, how badly losing him affected his family and affected me. And... Um, I didn't want to do that to my family, but I also couldn't, I wasn't myself anymore. And that's when I really started understanding depression um, and PTSD. It, it, you, it changes everything. It changes the way you see yourself. It changes the way you see everybody around you. And you have a memory of who you were, but that's just not who you are now. Yeah. And uh, skydiving was something that pushed adrenaline through me and I would feel exhilarated and I would feel free. And I would see the world in a completely different light. I, I looked down at the world and I saw the world. And I saw myself falling into the world and falling back into life. And that rush literally made me feel like I wanted to survive. And that was probably also the, the earth coming at me at, you know, <laughs> a little over 100 miles an hour. But that makes you try to live, you know. You yeah. just do the running man back up into the plane. <laughs> Can't really do that, but. Um, so I was honoring his memory, but I was also going, and I didn't know why I was going as much as I was because it's kind of expensive, but it's very expensive. Let's be real. Okay. It's really (laughs) expensive. And I was using up all of my savings. So I decided to get certified and and I did that pretty quickly because after so many jumps, you kind of start running out of money. And, um, I only found out about how cheap it was after you get certified and you start going regularly through the people who did it regularly. So, uh, I I did that and it was worth it to me because it was what made me feel. And after I would go for a jump, my stress was so low. Like the rest of the week after the weekend was so much easier because for some reason I had that rush. I got that out and I felt exhilarated and I felt powerful and I really needed to get stronger. So I started exercising more and getting rid of bad habits. Yeah. So, Which um, is another release. Yeah, you know, through fitness. Exactly, yeah. and if you're not strong, you can't really control your parachutes. So, yeah, I I noticed that when I was going, I was seeing um, a lot of veterans there, and I was saying, so I've seen you here a few times. You know, what's your story? Because I'm coming here too. Yeah, and they'd just say, I don't know. I just I like doing it, and I jumped when I was there. Or uh, sometimes they didn't. You know, they weren't paratroopers, but they just said, I just need to get this out. And a lot of the instructors that I would talk to everywhere said I had this going on in my life it was really negative but when I found skydiving I found a really positive outlet now some people will never skydive and that's fine some really amazing strong military people will never skydive and that's fine I didn't want to yeah (laughs) and I still I love it but it's like every time before I get out the plane it is I'm absolutely afraid and then like you said it's the it's the best release you know, as soon as that canopy opens and I know like, okay, everything's going to be all right. Like my life, it, it's this weird, you know, stillness in the air where I yeah. feel that, that the most amount of peace in my life is the moment after the canopy opens. It's just me. It's a clear blue sky, you know, and everything kind of comes together. Mm-hmm. And then a few seconds later, boom, you're back on earth. And it's like, that was amazing. But, you know. That's... It's exciting. And that's why, like, when you, I had jumped before I had met you and it had never crossed my mind that it could be healthy. 
because every time I jumped, I was always so worried. And I never looked at the effects after. I was like, thank God the jump is over and I survived. Yeah. And I'm like, now I can get back to, to doing my job. And uh, after having met you and you were like, hey, skydiving saved my life. This is, this is how it happened. You know, and, and you were like, I would love to see it happen from, for veterans, you know, on, on a regular basis. And I was like, oh my God, she's a genius. Like <laughs> this thing needs to happen. And we went back and forth. We had, we had several meetings trying to figure out, you know, exactly like I wanted to learn more about the process and learn more from you about the PTSD and the stuff that you'd seen and done uh, and, and how Brad's death had affected you. And how you would come out on the other side so that we could gear a program that would in turn help veterans as much as possible. And that was the slow birth of Freedom Free Fall that we honestly never thought was probably going to actually happen because of all of the red tape associated with not being able to get insurance and this, that, the other. But now, thanks to thanks to a football game meeting you, you know, and, and ultimately like it goes all the way back to, to Brad, mm-hmm. you know because of him and and leads up to this you know he's potentially now saved the lives of many other veterans that have that have gone out and and started skydiving Mm -hmm. you know so when you you can look all the way back in a process to where where it comes from and i tell it to people i'm like honestly some somebody gave their life so that you could have this opportunity today because all of these dominoes had to align and and go together or we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be jumping you today. You know? Right. And that's like, it's crazy when you think about it that way. And when I explain it to people, they're like, oh my God, like this is, you know, I, I don't know what to say. And I'm like, you know, that's pay, pay it forward, you know, make sure that people know next year. So this year we had 45 more people than we can jump, sign up. So like now the the program has reached a point that is astronomical, and I think this is the fourth year of the pro of the event. It's yeah, it's gonna be yeah. the fourth year. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, Brad Brad passed away. Um, actually, coming up <clears throat> is the um, he passed away May twenty second of twenty thirteen. So it's gonna be five years, and um, so this coming year will be the fourth year that that freedom free fall yeah. happened and it's crazy it, it doesn't seem like i mean gosh it seems like just yesterday we were at that football game and you know yeah. really amazing um coincidences happened from that that made this all come together and you know i i remember talking to uh mino about it and i just said you know i had to after I, I met with the veterans that were there and also just talking to the other people that were skydiving and, you know, why is this so addictive, but also why does this take somebody that's coming from a really bad place in their life and, and help them get into a good place in their life? Yeah. Um, specifically with PTSD, I was telling Mino that um, from the research that I did, what I understood was that when you have a flight or f- fight or flight reaction, you get an adrenaline rush and you need to do something about that. And when you skydive, you get an adrenaline rush. And instead of not being in control when you're trained, you react to live. And when you, I always thought it was the part about the way you react to open your parachute. Okay. That that was the part that had the impact. But what you just said about, your favorite part being when you your canopy opens and you know everything's going to be okay. Just now, it actually clicked in my head even more. Another reason why this is so beneficial to people, it's not just the fact that you're trained, you're in control, you jump out of a plane, you've got this adrenaline fight or flight reaction and you control yourself in a way yeah. that helps you live. It's the fact that you go from falling and being totally out of control which is my favorite part. <laughs> I know part. we both have different favorite parts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what makes it so awesome. It is. And and you go from that to your canopy opens and you slow down and then all of a sudden it's that silence. It's that calm. So you relive this fight or flight thing that happens with PTSD, which normally sends you in a negative spiral. Yeah. But 
through skydiving, you get that part of it, but then all of a sudden everything's okay. It's calm, it's peaceful, and it's beautiful, and you're in control, and you're making it work. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it's really all-encompassing to have the, the reaction that it does on the brain to be therapeutic. It can be emotionally therapeutic, but there's, there's still chemistry behind that. And so being unbreakable is something that happens through practice. It is not something that um, people just know how to do all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think you learn more and more as you go. No, and that's what I was just going to ask you was to define unbreakable to you. And I think that that, that is an awesome way to describe it because it is through practice. It's through rehearsals. You got to, you got to keep doing it or, or you can't be at anything at any one thing that you want to be unbreakable at. You have to focus on that thing and you have to work. It's not easy. Life isn't easy. It's like we talked about that roller coaster thing. Exactly. Getting through those dips, it's it's not easy. It's work. And in a relationship, it's not easy. Oftentimes, there's there's work that needs to be done. But it's all about trying to make that upward projection. You know, the whole time. It's it's an upward projection that can only happen if you forgive yourself for falling down, and if you make mistakes and you choose to learn from it. Instead of just getting mad and beating yourself up more. Um, I really you, like that, that you have to forgive yourself. It's you know? huge. It's kind of like building up a muscle. You know, you have to break all those muscle fibers and eat the protein and all that. You have yeah. to kind of break yourself to get stronger. And the most unbreakable people that I know have pushed themselves through really, really difficult things. And sometimes they don't know if they're going to make it. They don't know if they're going to achieve their goal. They might feel like they're at their bottom and they might not see a way out. I didn't think that I was going to be able to see a way out. Um, when I started skydiving, I did it to honor his memory. I didn't do it to treat the PTSD that I didn't know I had at the time. Yeah, you had no idea that it was going to help fix you. Right. You know, help make you stronger. No idea. No, I just knew that I was so, doing some crazy things and awesome. I couldn't stop doing it. And then the people that I met, the people that I talked to helped me realize that this was really, really a good thing. And I, I talked to other people in the health, healthcare industry and the psychologist that I was talking to and a psychiatrist who didn't really give her opinion, but just said, oh, I can understand that. So this is what happens with this part of the brain and this and that. And I, putting all the pieces together, I was just like, this is huge. And it's really expensive, so it's great to have a foundation like the Fourth Hua, which makes it possible to take veterans on this this jump, the Freedom Freefall, which you know was our dream when we when we talked about creating yeah. an event. Um, I didn't. Yeah, you're right. I didn't know if it was really going to happen or not. Neither did I. <laughs> but you made it. You really made it happen, and. Brad had talked about wanting to have a foundation when he first started going to counseling. He said, I wish I could do more to help veterans that are coming back. Now, this is when he was feeling really manic. He would go really, really positive and then really, really negative. Yeah. And I just want to let everybody out there know, you know, it happens. People get manic. People get really positive and really negative. And it's all about finding your coping skills. It's about having positive coping skills. And if skydiving is your thing, that's amazing. Yeah. If something else is your thing and it's positive and it's good for you, that's amazing. But the first thing we have to do is talk and, and we have to be okay with talking about it. We have to talk about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's why I talk about this. For a long time, you know, the, the first time that, that the Freedom Free Fall was going to happen, you and I were talking about making it happen. Yeah. And I had to back out from doing the physical, you know, going out there and talking to people part of it because it was triggering flashbacks for me. Yeah. And having to tell the story over and over so close to right after it ha when it happened was bringing me right back down into the most difficult spot. And I think this is why... You know, a lot of a lot of veterans stop hanging out with with other veterans for a while because it's a little too real for a little while. And that camaraderie, that friendship, that bond is so important. I got away from that for a little too long. 
and I started going back downhill again. And when we said, you know, what is unbreakable? Well, my definition of being unbreakable is being able to overcome being broken every day. You have to do it every day. Yeah. Some days are harder than others. And um, some days you don't feel like you deserve to be unbreakable. People always say, you know, you're tooting your own horn or you're going to get a big head or whatever. But yeah. you know what? If If I want someone else to do well, I know how I feel about my friends and family. I want the best things for my friends and family. So shouldn't I want that for me too? Absolutely. You need to want it for you. Yeah. yeah if you to. don't want it for you, you can't be there for other people. It's, you know, if you're not capable of taking care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take you care of take someone care else. Of yeah. And you got to find, you got to find positivity and everything. It's like I said before, you know, where you have people that are like, you know, you do hua for, for yourself. And I'm like, you know what? Absolutely. Because I'm the one that when I help a veteran, I get this emotional high. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're right. I do it for myself. This, you know what? And some people see it as the most selfless act. And I'm like, at the same time, it's a selfish act as well, because I'm taking care of somebody and I get to have this awesome emotional high. That like I help this person pay their bill or I help them get back on track or, or I, through this program that, that we created, get to go and watch them jump out of an airplane for a day mm -hmm. and to take a, my, the coolest jump is still Ollie 90 some year old world war two. I was, yeah, Just, I remember that. See you later, Ollie. <laughs> I actually, I handled the camera for, for mine yeah. cause he wouldn't go in the plane. Yeah. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like you got to see this, this guy who's his last jump was into yeah. world war two yeah. and he jumped again and he's like, this is the greatest day of my life. Was that getting was to jump out of a plane again. Historical. That was amazing. And, and that's one of the many effects. And everybody who jumps gets to the ground and they come running over with all these thanks and, and oh my God, you're so amazing. And we get to sit there and take that all in. And and you know, as selfless of an act as it is, it's also selfish because it is creating this high for me, you know, internally that that I get and I get to take that with me down the road. And it's you know why why much like you said you have to be in it for yourself as well mm -hmm. and through that process of of being in it for for me and me getting that emotional high i'm able to stay motivated you know and, and keep pursuing the, this direction otherwise i'd burn out there's no doubt it just i was just kind of thinking the same thing it's you know i i've had people actually say some pretty nasty things online um like you know you're making this about you or you're, why are you trying to get attention for this or that? And it's like, no, it's not about me. Thing. I get the same it's thing. It's about, yeah, it's about the cause. Like, I don't want to relive my worst nightmare over and over and over. Or have anybody relive that nightmare. God, no. And, yeah. and that's what it's all about is trying to prevent someone else from having to go through this. That's why, you know, I really have to get better at, at kind of like summarizing what it was like, but it's, it's hard because it's raw. There's it's no, like, yeah, no I'm, need to summarize. This no, is... I'm walking through it Yeah. in my mind. Like it happened, like I'm really back there and that that's really difficult. And hopefully in time it'll get easier. But the, the point of having to revisit that is to help other people. No, and, I mean, it gave me chills. Like I know that, that the story that you told, I know that it's going to, help a ton of people a ton of people moving forward because it's the feedback that i got after the gala and after you've spoken at freedom free fall and things like that it's astronomical and that's why i couldn't wait to have you on here to just tell the story and let people know that you know it, it gets bad and it'll get really really bad but you gotta you gotta get through it keep and pushing you gotta start to climb and, and you gotta find things and try things like you went and tried jumping out of an airplane with yeah. no idea that it was going to work for you. And now look at you. You're, 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 the next question that I'm going to ask you is what's next? And I, th I think well, we know what, one of the what's next is that you're going skydiving here in a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was just going to say that the thing that I noticed about you, you know, you said that when I was talking, people said it, it really moved them at the gala. And, and I went back and I watched that and I'm like, my gosh, I, I messed up so many things that I, ha I have to describe this and I didn't do that. And, and that's what it's all about. And that's what I see when I see you and Chelsea doing the work that you do is like, 
you guys put yourselves out there and there's there are going to be haters no matter what you do there's no matter what haters. you've been through there's always just haters. it's just one more thing that tries to knock you down you know what don't let the negativity win because what matters is not the the person that's trying to stomp you down it's the person that needs that hand up that's yeah. what matters that's why we're talking that's why you do what you do it's why I do what I do. And what's next for me, first of all, is, you know, always make it through one more day. That's what I do. And I had to stop skydiving for a while for health reasons, but I still contribute to helping other people go skydiving if they can be helped the way that I was helped. Um, but I am going uh, – with another person skydiving in, gosh, what, on the 15th, 16th, yeah, I'm so flying awesome. on the 15th. And um, I'm going to do it again on the 22nd in honor of Brad's memory. And it's not about, <clears throat> it's not about um, never letting go. It's not about that. It, everybody has to let go of things in their own time when they're ready and I don't think I'll ever let go of that part because that is in honor of him. And it's when I jump out of the plane, I know what I'm going to be thinking about. I'm going to, for one, I'm going to be talking to Brad and I'm going to say, I love you. And because of a tragedy that I know he would take back if he could, but because of the desire to be unbreakable, the desire to help others, the desire to put love back into life and life back into love. Because of that, <clears throat> because Brad happened at all in my life, there are other people that are going to be better. There's going to be family members that don't have to lose their person. They're going to be friends that, that don't have to lose their person, not like that. And if that only ever helped one person, that's enough. That's good. For one, I, I do it for myself too. You know, I need to help myself. I need to feel better. Yeah. But if I can feel better and get so excited that, oh my gosh, like I didn't think there was a light at the end of the tunnel and there is, holy crap, you know, who would have yeah. thought I need to bring this to other people? Like, hey, hey, hey. If nothing's working for you and you have even like a little temptation to try this, go do it. Go do it. Like Absolutely. don't go get plastered. Don't do drugs. Don't do that stuff. Like don't drown your sorrow that way. Like if you want to do something really cool, do something really cool that's good for you. Yeah. Find your passion, your outlet, your coping skills, and then hang out with other people that do that too. Yeah. Like-minded people. Yeah. Like-minded people is, is the best thing you can have around you. And that I'm surrounded by like-minded people. I love it. And it has given me such a better, healthier life. And it's, it's awesome. You know, it's, I don't even know what to say about it. It just makes me super happy when I look at it and do my like self-evaluations and the people that I've surrounded myself with and the people that I, that I talk to and enjoy talking to, like, it just makes me feel so good. I, I see you get inspired by others, but I see you inspire so many other people. Like, I look at what you're doing in these, like, records and the Facebook stuff, and I'm just like, Will is so much cooler than me. Like, this. But that's not the case. I'm not at all. I'm not at all. Well, that's the thing about inspiring other people is that when you surround yourself with like-minded people and they bring out the best in you instead of surrounding yourself with people that bring out the worst in you. Yeah that's when it's just mutually beneficial for everybody. So oh, exactly. everything that you do, this podcast is something that you made this happen, you know, and the people out there listening are making this happen too. Yeah. And this so. isn't, this isn't my idea. Much like freedom free fall. I'll never take credit for the freedom free fall idea. That's a hundred percent you. Um, this podcast wasn't my idea. It was an idea of several people that were like, this has to happen. This will cause change for so many people and make so many people's lives better and I, and I see that already and we're five episodes deep this is episode six and to have that that level of positive effect it like it makes me want to be doing these episodes every single day and that's why I explained to you the process to which we're going to get there and you're going to be a part of that process and I'm 
I'm super excited for that, and I can't wait Anywhere to like. I can help. And I can't wait to have you back on here numerous times because your story is so strong that I know that it's going to affect so many people. For people out there listening, if you you know, if you want to help in any way, if you know anybody that can help in any way, just you know, talk to people about the podcast. If you have questions, you know send the questions yes, i mean will i'll i'll answer questions if people say you know as long as they're not trolling but <laughs> if people say you know no exactly you talked about this a little bit or you talked about this but they have another question about it i'll answer it then cuz i know like telling the story is difficult it's challenging and um it's not for everybody but whatever i can do if it contributes to making anybody's life better veteran or not I want to do that through being able to share, you know, my story so that it's not someone else's story. And you do that. You do that already. And it's got, it's got huge effects. Like, I, I don't know how many compliments you get, but I've gotten a ton on your behalf. I, I jet so. afterwards because <laughs> yeah. I'm usually like, ah, I got to go yeah. home. But, um, but you know, it'll get easier. I, I try to think about, what do I ultimately want to feel like? And I want to feel like I'll never be the way I used to be, but I want to feel close to that. I want to feel like, um, when you say being unbreakable, I want to feel like I can set a goal and not be afraid of accomplishing it or not feel undeserving of accomplishing it. And being unbreakable. That's a very powerful line. It, it, a lot of times, I mean, what, what gets in the way of accomplishing a goal? It's fear. always fear fear, or there is another issue of feeling like you don't deserve it. Yeah, no, so, absolutely. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's fear. Maybe that's fear too. But whatever it is, like it's, it's you learn how to get to your goal by practicing getting to your goal. Yeah. And it's okay to make a mistake. No, ah, absolutely. I go, I've gone in, so this goal right now, mine is this world record. Uh, and I've gone and I've ran the finish line probably 50 times now. That's like, amazing. Honestly, I was there again uh, yesterday morning running up the finish line so that I've been there before. I know what it feels like and I know how to get there. And that's what it is. It's just practice that's it. So if you want that goal, just go out and go out and work towards it. it. It always takes a little bit of work and you just can't give up when when things don't necessarily go, you know, the way that you want them to. Yeah. You just got to keep going. I still can't believe you're doing that. It, it's, that's yeah, can so I. cool. It's pretty stupid. <laughs> no, it's, awesome. it's, it's, it's awesome. awesome. It's a, it's a, it's a, the, the next fundraiser, you know, it's the next way for us to do more. So, and, and it's yeah. been working. We're well on our way to over 10 grand in that, in that event. So I'm not going to do it again after this time, unless I fail, then I'm going to, you know, get right back up. Go find another race. Go yeah. break the world record. So well, it's going to happen. It's, I mean, I guess anytime somebody has a goal, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, make it through another day or set a record or build a business or learn how to finally get good at, you know, fighting off your demons and being successful at a relationship or just a good goal is to, really figure out if you're being real with yourself and to be okay with that and to be okay with being yourself to other people to really help you feel balanced. Um, So I think, you know, anybody you talk to, whether they're an athlete or a business person or another good example of being unbreakable will tell you that there's some soul searching involved and that's good. That's, that's a good thing. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, everybody. Well, on that note, we're gonna, we're gonna end it so that, uh, I can upload it all and and get it out to you guys on Monday. So thank you, Charity, for coming on and being a part of this and helping get helping get your story out there for people that are are going through going through those similar things with with somebody they know Mm -hmm. um, or have just gone through uh, the loss of somebody. Or if they're thinking that they feel like like they're at their bottom, you know, don't give up. Push yourself one more time to find your inspiration. Absolutely. 100% agreed. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Forever Unbreakable, we're out. Thanks. That was fun.
That was really long. I need that's, to learn how to shut up. You're good. Don't uh, worry about it.